we're going to start, and I'm going to give you an, an introduction and all of this, and I'm going to start it out with a pretty sobering quote. And that sobering quote is from George Washington Carver, and he says, whenever the soil is wasted, the people are wasted. A poor soil produces only poor people, poor economically, poor spiritually, poor intellectually, and poor physically. That's pretty sobering, right? When you really stop and think about it is that we have got to realize the value of our soil and everything else. And I will tell you at the beginning here that if you want these slides when I get through, you have my email address at the very end that you can email me and I'll be glad to send them to you. So anyway, we're going to talk about the functions of soil and all of this. And why do we need soil? Because we need the water, we need the air, we need all of these other things that go on relative to soil out here. And we got to think about it from this standpoint that we are in the carbon business, we're in the water business, and we're in the nutrient business. And they're all linked together. And how do we begin to put these into pieces? And all of this because there's a big buzz around carbon right now. We talk about carbon markets, we talk about all this. But why is carbon important? Is because carbon is like water and oxygen. Without it, there's no life. And if you think about it from this perspective, is that carbon in biological systems is really this way. Almost 20% of what we are is carbon. And it's the foundation of all macromolecules. If you remember organic chemistry, if you went through all of that in college or even in high school, you find out that organic chemistry is all about how we complex carbon and all sorts of oxygen, hydrogen, and all the other things that go with that. But it, carbon has this unique ability to be able to bind with all different elements. And so that's what makes it so unique at all these different processes. And so there's all of that, plus the fact that carbon is really about the energy that we drive the system with. And you think about it from that process, and what we're going to go is through this overall thing of saying, how do we bring all this together that leads to soil health? How do we put it together? And so we're going to start with the whole process of capturing carbon. And this process of excuse me, capturing carbon is really pretty simple. We take sunlight, we take water, in the process of photosynthesis, we create a simple sugar. We create that simple sugar that goes through leaf, plant leaves, some of it goes down through the stem, some of it comes out the roots that goes into root exudates, that feeds all the biology that drives the carbon cycle, drives the nutrient cycle, ultimately drives the water cycle and all of this. And so you think about this overall piece is that when you grow a plant, you are in the carbon capture business. Because what you're doing is basically taking carbon out of the atmosphere and you're putting it in there. And you look at all these different things and you really begin to understand these dynamics. Here's another piece of this puzzle that comes from a couple of Russian authors that begin to look at the sugars that are coming out of the roots. These root exudates are primarily sugars. And they begin to look at us, and I want you to pay attention to one particular dynamic of this slide. And that's that time scale at the bottom. Things that go from seconds to years. Because we find that when we add sugars to that soil, we see a response almost immediately. Is that we spike that microbial system with sugar and we see a burst of CO2 coming out. It's sort of like giving your kids Mountain Dew just before bed. Bad decision, right? <laughs> all of these other things that happen and all these other things that are going on in this complex diagram is really about how do we begin to think about these dynamics that go on within the soil and how do we make those to our advantage? And so recently we've really begun to think about this process from an entirely different perspective in which we begin to think about this whole thing of how exudates are there, what happens to them, how much energy do they provide, how that really helps us in terms of the overall soil processes that are going on. So you think about that leaf that's capturing CO2 out of the air, making that simple sugar, moving it down. We find out that about 40% of that sugar is moving out of the root. And so if you dig up roots and you find out that it's a little bit slimy, and if you analyze that, you find out that it's mostly glucose. You really begin to look and say, what are we doing in that microbial system? 
Glucose is the most abundant. We get some fructose, we get saccharose, we get ribose. A lot of that's just going back out to the atmosphere in terms of CO2 because we have an aerobic system underneath that soil that's feeding this. As we begin to change that aerobic system, just like you and I, we take in oxygen, we give off CO2, and that's the way the soils do as well. So we're giving off a lot of CO2, but that's part of the life processes that are going on. Ultimately, just a few, small portion of that actually ends up in soil organic carbon. These Russian authors also looked at it from this perspective, and they looked at the amount of sugars going on and the changes in soil organic matter content. The more sugars we put into the soil, the higher the soil organic matter change over time. And you see it, and there's differences in soils, there's differences in ecosystems, all these other things. But the bottom line is that the more we can capture sugar and the more we can put it back into that system, the better we can make that soil change over time. So it becomes a reality of how do we think about this overall process that's going on. And so the fate of these sugars in the soil is some of them are simple glucose. They're really short-term pieces in there. Polysaccharides are the, really the glue that holds clay particles together, sand, silt, and clay. Those are the things that are really kind of the overall glue. You got glucoproteins. Now you added a nitrogen piece into that whole thing. So they begin to bind the minerals. They begin to all of these other things that happens that create a very stable soil aggregate out there. We got one piece that we always talk about carbon sequestration, and you all hear about that from the whole carbon market piece. In reality, that really starts with that individual plant up there. It took me a long time to explain to people that in the carbon markets that carbon didn't magically go from the atmosphere to the soil. You have to have a living plant to make that all work. They thought that carbon just kind of just got sequestered there. Realize you've got to look at it from a different perspective. And the other piece of this in terms of this overall dynamic that we'll talk about a little bit as well is that we need to have this carbon to maintain our biological activity because it's an energy source. It's all the other pieces that go with that in terms of this aspect of microbial activity and function and all of this. Another little piece of this puzzle that is pulled together, and if you look at it from this perspective, this is a, a study that Wishmeyer and his coworkers did because they looked at all the literature around the world and they said, what really drives the changes in soil organic carbon over time? And the changes in soil organic carbon, when they looked through all the different literature around the world, is the number one thing that drove that was microbial activity. The second piece was how we managed our land, our clay, and then how we managed our land. Finally, at the bottom of that whole list was physics and chemistry. It really upset a lot of soil physicists and a lot of soil chemists that they were no longer number one in thinking about soil change, is that really we drove it from the whole biological processes. If we want soil to change, what you're really cultivating is the biological system. We're cultivating the biological system to say, how do we take and make use of all the CO2 we capture, create it into sugar, put it back into microbial system that then changes the soil. And so it really becomes an interesting dynamic when we think about this overall process. But if you can make it simpler than this, because this is a diagram we put together a number of years ago that said, if we're gonna change the soil, and you think about changing the soil as a ladder or staircase, anything else, the first rung on that ladder is biological activity. We've gotta have the biological activity and then we see that manifested in itself in what I call the, the invisible processes. So organic turnover, organic matter turnover, nutrient cycling, we know they're happening, but we really can't see them. But what we do see at the end is changes in aggregation. We've seen changes in water storage. We've seen changes in soil color. We see all these different things that have occurred because we've changed the biological activity and we've made use of all this. But biology wants four things. It wants food, water, air, and shelter. What do you want? 
Last couple of weeks, you really valued that shelter piece, right? <laughs> you know, 40 below wind chills, things like that. Shelter was really kind of critical. But we want to be fed. We've got to have air to breathe. We've got to have water. And we need to protect that environment. Shelter takes on many different aspects of all of this. And so that changes the whole biological system. That change in that biological system is critical of how do we begin to think about changing the soil and all the different pieces that go with this. What's the most limiting factor in crop production? Water. That's number two. Water is the most limiting factor. What? Do you want to know why? Ready? Okay. So the question really becomes is now we've got to add another piece to this puzzle. If water is the most limiting factor, and I just talked about carbon at the very beginning, is how does water and carbon all fit together? How does water and carbon really become part of this overall soil health process that we need to think about? And so let's go back and think about just some simple pieces of this puzzle. And the simple pieces of this puzzle is that we know that texture of the soil has a lot of impact on how we can hold water. Because we go from sands, we have very little water holding capacity because it's hard to hold water around a clay or sand particle. Now you get down to clays, we've got a lot of spaces in them, you can hold a lot more water in that. But the more interesting piece is that graph that's over on the right side, and it's by Hudson, who is a former SCS or SCS employee. He went through all of the soil survey data and looked at the relationship between organic matter and water holding capacity because that was one of the measurements that they made between wilting point and field capacity and all this. It exists in the database. So he went through and he looked at this and said, what's the relationship between how much organic matter there was and the water holding capacity? And found out there was a nice linear relationship. The more organic matter we put in the soil, the higher the water holding capacity. And just to put that in perspective of what that means is you take all of that and you just go down to that graph at the bottom. And the graph at the bottom, I got very curious about this and I said, what really happens when we change the organic matter from a different perspective? And now if you just take a corn crop in central Iowa, middle of August, uses about three tenths to four tenths of an inch of water a day, assumed a five foot profile because I was really generous on how deep that corn plant could go and said at 2% organic matter, how many days of water was available in that five foot profile for that corn to grow and not be stressed? So at 2% organic matter, you're about eight days of available water. At 4%, you're 13 days of available water. So you go from two to 4%, you got five more days of available water. And what does that mean? What's five more days in which that crop isn't stressed? Profit. <laughs> middle of August and everything else. And the reason, and I now give you full disclosure, because if you read my bio, you say, why is this guy involved in soil health? Because my background is in agricultural meteorology and statistics. So I deal in the relationship between crops and the weather. For many years, I spent all working on water dynamics of crops how it became water use efficient, how you looked at all these different pieces, but really got to the point that we saw a lot of different things and said, you know, there's a lot of variation in fields in productivity, and that variation is due to water. So if we want to improve the capacity of that water or plant to survive stress, one of the easiest things is to start improving the soil and how much water it can hold. So it really became a very selfish thing saying, I can do better in terms of productivity by looking at how that plant captures water, utilizes water, and puts it together from a different perspective. So you really begin to think about this process from a different dynamic. If you just look at it this way, when we change organic matter, we don't really change that wilting point that much, but we do change how much water that plant can, or that soil can hold. That 
glue that polysaccharides or the glucosaccharides that go around those particles have an absorption capacity of about eight times. So every time we add a carbon piece in there, we can actually add eight more units of water. That's how much absorption capacity it has. And so you think about it, is that we really become very dynamic in all of this. And since water is one of the most limiting factors in crop productivity, the best thing we can do is start adding more carbon to change our water balance. And so if we would decrease that, we decrease the size of that box, and if we go the other way and we add more organic matter, we increase the size of that box and we make more water available to that crop with all this different perspective. But here's another piece of this puzzle. If you went to Eli's talk in terms of carbon, he, he talked about all the different things that are going on in terms of changes over time. Here's just another piece of this puzzle. These are the long-term experiments that were at the Morrow plots in Illinois and the Sanborn plots in Missouri. They started those experiments back in the 1800s. And you look at this rapid, and they have all these different rotations going on. There's just three of them. I just want you to pay attention to the two lines that are continuous corn. Sanborn plots about 70% of that original organic matter was already lost, and you can see how rapidly that thing went down. You see that the uh, moral plots, it wasn't quite as uh, rapid a decrease as it was in Sanborn because you have different temperatures and you have different uh, rainfall patterns between Columbia, Missouri, and Champaign, Illinois. But we've lost organic matter. In Iowa, we estimate that we've lost 70% of our original organic matter over these years. We've made that system much more vulnerable to all the things that are going on. We know that agricultural systems have changed our soils. When we've looked at the carbon balance going on, we've looked at the water balance over time, is that we've removed our organic matter by tillage because we keep oxidizing it and we're moving it back into the air. We see that cropping systems no longer return as much carbon because they're short parts of this growing season. And we see all this that we've reduced the functionality of our soils. We've made them much more dependent on external inputs. We don't have that nutrient cycling going on, all of these other things, and we have increased erosion rates. All of these things are happening in all of this. What we have seen in all of this is that over time, and we've verified it both by how we measure CO2 in the atmosphere and its changes during a growing season and soil survey or soil sample analysis, is that we in a typical corn soybean system across the corn belt lose 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. Multiply that by 40 years of farming, and what do you have? 20 tons of carbon loss. We've changed organic matter time, and you go back to the Sanborn plots and the uh, Morrow plots, and that's why that rapid decay, because we intensively tilled those crops as we went in, and we put all that together. So what we consider as proper management is slowly degrading our soils. You say, well, 1,000 pounds of carbon isn't much. It's half a ton. And so it adds up over time. We've lost our ability to store water because that 1,000 pounds of carbon is really about 8,000 pounds of water available. Here's another piece of this puzzle just to put it into a different perspective for you. Whoops. I don't know why the slides don't show up. We did an analysis, and I'll explain it to you. We did an analysis looking at relationship between what we call the National Crop Commodity Productivity Index and uh, county level yields across three states, Kentucky, Iowa, and Nebraska. The NCCPI goes from zero to one. It's a nice index from that standpoint. Is that the better the soils, the higher the average county yield. We saw that in corn, we saw it in soybeans, we saw it in all these other crops. And if you look across the Midwest, is that the NCCPI is not consistent in there. As we move from east to west in the Corn Belt, uh, we see all these different changes. So you look at all this, 
The real question is how do we restore that soil productivity? How do you begin to look at changing the soil out there? We can go back to our regenerative practices that we put on and everything else. And we've heard that talked about many times. Most of you know these by heart by now because we got to talk about how do we change that soil armor. That's adding crop residue. How do you reduce the intensity of tillage out there? That's minimizing soil disturbance or changing the shelter piece of it. Maintaining continual living roots, because what we're really about is capturing that carbon out of the atmosphere, making that sugar, moving it down in. That's that continuous energy that we put into the system. How do we add diversity into this? Because diversity does pay, because Mother Nature, if you look at a natural system out there, you saw Glenn talk about it in terms of how many species are out there, is that we, in row crop agriculture, really look at monocultures. We don't want diversity, but in reality, Mother Nature wants diversity. Because when we begin to go to really complex cover crop systems, we see subtle changes in the differences in the exudates that come out of them, which also then generate a difference in the microbial activity and the, and the species richness in all of this. So diversity has many different forms in all of this. And then the other piece of regenerative agriculture is how do we begin to integrate livestock? How do you begin to put that livestock component into that? Because that byproduct of livestock, the urine and the manure in particular, the carbon-nitrogen ratio is that is in the sweet spot for microbial activity. The other things that we can look at in all of this so we've now switched over and we no longer think about all these different dynamics from a different perspective, is that we think about it entirely from the energy perspective. The energy perspective is really this, because that upper line up there is how much solar radiation is coming in, how we capture that, we put it through that plant, so we can look at all the different flows of energy coming in. The bottom part of that graph is what goes back out. How much goes on in respiration, how much goes on when we till that soil, all these different things. So now we have a complete energy balance that says, let's look at it from a calorie perspective because think about it this way. If you consume more calories than you have in maintenance, what happens? You gain weight, right? If we want our biology to really begin to change that soil, we've got to supply more energy than what's required for maintenance. But the sad truth is, going back to that aspect of losing 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year, is that we are starving our microbial systems because we're not giving them enough energy. So you just look at this as an entirely different perspective, just to put it in peace for you, is that that upper left graph is, is just actual solar radiation throughout the whole day. I took that actual solar radiation, put it into that other piece that's just in the growing part of the corn plant and how much photosynthate we were capturing out of that plant. The blue line at the bottom is how much we estimate going into the root system. That's expressed in units that you're probably not familiar with, but one megajoule is 239,000 calories. If you look at that lower graph in there, is that we're about a half a megajoule. We're pumping about 100,000 calories per square yard per day into that soil. You say, that can't be right. That's just way too big. What'd you hear from Glenn? How many microbes? or in a handful of soil. I'll give you a different dynamic on it. A really active soil on a per acre basis has about 10,000 pounds of biological material underneath that surface. To give you a visual on that, because it's hard to imagine what 10,000 pounds looks like, is that two African elephants per acre. Now imagine looking out at a 160 acre field and you see 320 elephants standing out there on top of it. Now you got a perspective of how much biology is underneath that soil. 
And you can ask yourself, how am I going to feed 320 elephants <laughs> and all of this? Because they consume a lot. So that's an aspect of how do we begin to think about this. It takes a lot of energy to maintain that microbial activity and all of this. But the other piece of this that would begin to change this is because we ran those long-term experiments where we saw that we were losing that 1,000 pounds of carbon. So we took a field, 320-acre field, of corn and beans, and we changed it in the fall of 2016 to a no-till cover crop. We have the same instruments over it, so we know this. We sampled that field at 150 foot by 150 foot grid down to a depth of four feet, much more intense than anybody would ever sample in all of this. And we measured the microbial biomass in the fall of 2016. We came back in the fall of 2017 and we sampled again. And that first year, we doubled the microbial biomass in that upper foot. We really begin to change that soil. Run growing season, we've seen changes within 140 days in terms of some systems. But the other piece of this is really how do we think about these overall dynamics? Because now we've added that crop residue layer, we've reduced the tillage intensity, well, that's that call the maintaining soil armor out there. This is the immediate benefit that you see out of changing the system because you change the water balance. You change the water balance in three ways. Is that residue or living crop cover out there, intercepts rainfall, takes all the energy out of that rainfall so that it no longer hits the soil surface directly, moves down through that plant material into the soil and we maintain the infiltration rates. So we begin to see that piece of it. Second piece of it is we, because we have that residue and we have that standing uh, crop out there, is that we reduce the soil water evaporation rate. We reduce it by as much as 80%. So we take that 80% water that we save and we put it back through that crop that that's where we get productivity. And the other piece is what we see is a lot of those plant root distributions now change because now we're moist and we're wet in there and so we can keep plant roots very near the surface and all of this. The other piece of this is that in all of this we change the temperature dynamics. And so we see all of this, we reduce the temperature extremes. I'll just show you one piece of this puzzle, is we got very curious about how hot soils really got. Had one stint of my career in which I was in Lubbock, Texas, working on skip row cotton, was two rows of cotton and two, skip two rows and plant two rows of cotton, is that that area in between those two rows that wasn't planted would get to 150 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's way too hot to work, walk barefooted on. In Iowa, so we have the same capabilities, we begin to look and say, how hot does that soil get? And so what we did is we said, how many hours is this crop exposed or soil exposed to temperatures above 104 degrees Fahrenheit? And the reason we chose 104 is that's when proteins begin to denature. That's when they begin to break down. And so you just look across there, you see the number of hours that that soil was above 104 degrees we added a crop residue, we looked at the hours that's above 104, and those are all plotted on the same graph, but none of them ever hit 104. They're always about 86, 87 degrees. We cook the life out of our soils by not having that residue layer out there. And we wonder why our biology isn't responding, is because they're not there. The more we till the soil, the more CO2 we see. This is some of the work from Don Rakowski. We break it all up, we see these big puffs of CO2 coming out in all of this. But I want to give you an example of changes that are going on. This is the journey that we have with uh, Wayne Fredericks. Wayne is basically just straight east of where Zach is, <laughs> almost the same highway, only he's on the other side of uh, I-35. Uh, Wayne and I often work together, well, we work together all the time in terms of looking at this, but we asked him and said, you know, what did you change over time? And here's his system. He adopted no-till beans in 1992 for this simple reason, is it froze in the fall of 92 and he couldn't get his fall tillage done. Nothing like a crisis to make a change. It worked so well, he had the same bean yields that he had when he was doing all the tillage. He said, why am I tilling and everything? So he went and he did this and then he had a strip till in, in 2002 on his corn. 
and added, started adding cover crops in 2012. You notice on that map, he's in the very northern part. This is in Mitchell County, Iowa, which is the border of Minnesota. So we looked at all this, and I asked Wayne, I said, you know, all of these changes that you've made in this, would you be willing to share your data? So we could begin to look and say, what's really changed in your fields over time? He says, you know, we've got organic matter samples. He gave us all his yield monitor data from 2002 to 2018 across 10 fields. We have the weather data going on for Mitchell County. We have the, the county level yield data. But we began to look at soil organic matter changes. We looked at field versus county uh, yields. Uh, we looked at field uniformity of yields. It took us a year to analyze all the data. And the reason is because we took and segregated all his yield monitor data by soil type within the field. So we'd open a mask of the soil type, so we say, you know, really what's happened? Here's what happened to his organic matters over time. Here's where we began to switch. He already had some pre-baseline samples of, of the changes that was going on because he was trying to make sure that herbicides relative to the organic matter content uh, were appropriately applied. Uh, there's been a in big increase. You see that 2.3 to, to 4.3 and all of this. Uh, we did sample fence rows so we know what our potential is uh, out there. But you see that you know, we've had a pretty good increase over time. That's kind of routine. What we spent more time on, and this is some other data that uh, Marty L. Casey had taken, just looking at different systems out there, uh, no-till and strip-till, chisel plow, deep rip, and no uh, moldboard plow. Anything that's above the line is accruing carbon. Anything below the line is losing carbon. This is some long-term sites across Iowa uh, and seeing the, the tillage effect. But here's the data that really got me excited. Because when we did that mask of saying, what's that relationship between yield with each soil out there, is we looked at the frequency distribution of those yields and how they were distributed. And just look at that change over time, and this is just two different soils, beginning of end to, to the end of the record that we had out there, is we took all those yields that were low out of that yield distribution and we made them tighter about the mean. Everybody always, you know, if you have four moments in statistics. You have mean, median, skewness, and kurtosis. And if you took statistics, you always go, what in the heck do I do with skewness and kurtosis? This is what you do with skewness and kurtosis. Um, anything that we disappear out of that left-hand yield is profit. Anything that you take and begin to make it tighter about the mean is also profit. So we see all these different pieces that are going on. We also saw that we were becoming more water use efficient. We were becoming more water use efficient because we we're making better use of what water was stored into that crop productivity. Relative to Mitchell County, we we're 40% on corn, about 20% on beans. And we were more nutrient use efficient as well. So Wayne put this together for me because we got very curious to talking about what we were savings. So we went through and he says, you know, I reduced my machinery cost by about $44 an acre. My, I saved labor at $27 an acre. Little P and K because we had more cycling going on. Nitrogen fertilizer because we hadn't changed the rates and yet we're getting more yield so we didn't have to apply uh, according to the recommendations. So we increased profitability somewhere in that order to about $100 an acre. That's not a bad return in terms of this process. So what do we need to understand? We need to understand this dynamic. And the dynamic is that because we do change this system, we change water, then we change carbon, and then we change nitrogen. Those things do not change simultaneously. It really looks something like this. We increase the water dynamic within the soil, we can increase crop productivity. Once we increase crop productivity, we have more carbon input into that soil. We have more carbon input into the soil, we increase the microbial activity, we improve nutrient cycling, we feed it back into increasing plant growth, which adds more carbon back into the soil. The more carbon we put in the soil, we increase the whole soil water dynamic. 
we need to understand that we do change water first, carbon tags along, and then nutrients tag along later. We need to understand these dynamics in this overall process. So Rick gets back down to this saying, how do we make sure that our biological activity is optimized by the systems that we're doing out there? So I came up and said, you know, what are our challenges in regenerative ag? And what's our challenges in soil health relative to opportunities and everything else? Really, and it's this, and I'll just summarize them for you, is that agriculture is best understood in the context of what I call genetics by environment by management. Genetics by environment and by management is very simply this. Management is what you do because you're trying to overcome the environment to optimize your genetics. You have control over the management options. And when you start thinking about the soil variability and the weather variability, how's that management play into that? Because profitability is really how that genetics is optimized. Not only in terms, because one of the neat things that we saw in Wayne's data is that the upper Midwest suffers from this problem. We're too wet in the spring, that we tend to have it, and above normal rainfall in April and May is when we have our lower county yields, and we have our higher county yields when we have above normal rainfall in July and August. We broke that correlation when we began to improve our soils out there. We see all these different pieces that go on. So we need to continually evaluate this practice. This is a continuous improvement process. Everybody says, well, how do I start soil health practices? Just start. Decide what you want to do, evaluate them, continue to evaluate them, tweak them and all these different times. I'm very frustrated because we have a lot of yield monitor data. We have a lot of data in agriculture, but we have little information. We need to really begin to think about how do we utilize this material? How do we utilize what we have in terms of yield monitor data, field variability, all these other things, is let us help and do a better system in all of this. And I'm also a firm believer in community. One of the things that gets, I see across the regenerative ag and the soil health aspect is that there's a lot more community going on than there is in conventional agriculture. Because you're willing to share ideas, you're willing to share concepts and everything else. So with that, I'm going to leave you with my contact information. There's my email. It's really pretty simple. You can also find me on LinkedIn uh, and everything else. Uh, and there's my cell phone number. It's 515-509-5331. If you call me or text me, well, texting, I, I'll figure out who you are. If you call me, you have to leave a voicemail. And tell me what you want, and I'll get back with you because... Most of the time I get calls about extended warranties, uh, <laughs> Medicare, uh, vacation rentals, uh, things like that. So you do get screened out there, I will tell you that, but I will get back with you on it. We do have an opportunity in agriculture. We have an opportunity in agriculture to really do much better than what we're doing. And it all starts with how do we change our soil to cycle water cycle carbon, and cycle nutrients. It's really as simple as that. So with that, I'll entertain some, oh, I'll just leave that up. I don't know, Clay, questions? Yes, sir. I've got a problem with these guys that want to capture carbon and pump it into the soil. <laughs> I want your opinion. <laughs> you mean pump it deep? It's probably one of the dumbest ideas we've had. <laughs> I no longer work for USDA, so I fully express my opinions. Uh, <laughs>
I could fully express my opinions when I worked for USDA, but sometimes I had to justify them. But uh, that is the, probably the dumbest thing we can do with our CO2. We are working with, uh, but we have an alternative for that. I'm working with a company right now that, that actually taking that excess CO2 and creating methanol out of it as a fuel that then can go back into track. Europe has done a lot with methanol and tractors. So we're looking at that. We actually have a pilot plant that will come on in Illinois this next summer. Um, to me, that's a much better use of this because now we could have a closed loop system. But this you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be for the government money if this thing wouldn't even be there. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's the whole carbon. I, we won't we don't have time to get into the whole carbon market piece of it. But I'll I'll just leave you this way. If you get into carbon for the carbon market piece of it, it's like new running board money for your pickup. If you get into carbon for you in terms of productivity, it's new pickup money. Running boards for your pickup or a new pickup? You, you make the choice. Because we, and those markets will collapse anyway. But uh, the other piece of this with putting carbon down in the soil, or down in the, unless you make a rock out of it, it's coming back out. Nature abhors a vacuum. Enough said. Other, one other question I see we're a little bit over, and they told me I had to stop at 5.15. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I'm around all evening. I do have to leave early in the morning because I have two more, four more talks in Missouri in the next two days. <laughs>